Thank you, Jeff. That was very nice. And largely true. <laughs> so, uh, I'm presenting today with, uh, with some of my students. And the title of today's talk, I'll actually stay close to the mic and avoid the walking because of the, uh, the, the video today. Title of my talk, it, it's one of those things I came up with it long before I actually wrote the talk, so it's semi-accurate. Uh, personality assessment, personality measurement, lessons from studies of politicians, professors, poets, and you. And I couldn't think of anything that started with a P to describe people in the, the second person, second person and the second person. I guess that would have worked. Um, I'll introduce uh, the other speakers as, as we proceed, but I want to begin by talking about personality psychology. And uh, as uh, Dean Buller said, I'm one of the founding members of the Honors College, and I've been doing this forum thing for years and years, since 1999. It made me feel old to hear myself described as uh, one of the founding people. And it makes me feel even older to reflect back on my first coursework in personality psychology uh, when I was you and when I encountered this field and was told things such as the outstanding characteristic of man, the people of us, is individuality. And quotes such as this from Clyde Cluckhone, an anthropologist, and Henry Murray, a personality psychologist, that every one of us is like all others, like some others, and like no others. And this is what personality psychology is about. You know, what do you share with the person next to you? And I don't mean donuts, you know. <laughs> what do you have in common? And what do you not have in common? And what do you share with your neighbor that you don't share, for example, with somebody at UCF? Okay? These three levels, the individual level of uniqueness, the kind of group level of human nature, and the intermediate level of how we differ, this is the stuff of personality psychology. So, um, personality psychology is really, it turns out that it's a difficult thing to study. Does anybody know where this is? New York. New York? Um, I would say close, but it's actually quite far from New York, and that's your first hint. Yes, San Francisco like, we're getting warmer. Although we could be getting colder, depending on which way we went, went around the world. That's your second hint. Japan. Japan. We're getting closer. Australia. Sydney, Australia. Sydney, Australia, of course, the cue being the tiny opera house right here in the middle of the, uh, the picture. It's Sydney. And uh, years ago, I, I lived in Sydney. My family moved to Sydney. Sydney's a, it's, it's a beautiful place. And... Um, and city is a city of diverse neighborhoods. It's kind of like a patchwork quilt where each neighborhood is really quite distinct from the others, as opposed to kind of a bland puree where everything's mixed up. And I was really struck by this. You know, uh, wandering around Sydney, you'd see suburbs like this one here. This is Surrey Hills, uh, very close to the central business district downtown here. Okay, and. Um, you see the houses are kind of jammed in next to each other. Uh, downtown, it's exciting, it's lively, it's noisy, it's kind of dirty, but it's all those things, okay? Second suburb, Balmain, on this peninsula here. And in this little picture, there'll be a, another one in a minute, you can see a little bit better, this is this little hill, and you can see off in the distance, that central business district, these, this neighborhood here. Uh, Balmain's a beautiful spot, but it's kind of hard to get to. You get from here to downtown, you've got to go all the way around. It turns out to be quite a, quite a schlep, as they don't say in Australia. Um, and uh, so that's Balmain. When we first lived in Sydney, we were down here in this suburb called Sylvania, Sylvan Green. And you can see that the houses are separate from each other, that they're surrounded by these large lawns. They don't have sidewalks, also. Okay? No sidewalks. And finally, the fourth suburb we can consider is Penrith, about a, a, uh, an hour to the west. This is west, and that's east, and that's north, and that's south. Penrith, an hour to the west of Sydney, 
in the foothills of the Blue Mountains, a beautiful spot, but a long way away. Okay? And the question for me as a personality psychologist is, of course, what sort of person is going to live in Surrey Hills or Balmain or Sylvania or Penrith? Okay? Does personality psychology, do personality traits predict the type of person who's going to live in these different things? I mean, as you look at these, how many of you would prefer to live in this? If you had to choose, okay? By the way, I'll tell you, there's a kind of roll of chance in life. When I was in Sydney, we had a neighbor, an old Polish man, who was a refugee from uh, World War II. And he told me why he lived in Australia as opposed to America. He said at the end of the war, he flipped a coin, and his whole life unfolded, Australia as opposed to America. Okay? So, you have a coin, it is a four-sided coin, you're going to live in one of these suburbs. Which one? Let me hear. Surrey Hills. Okay? Anybody else? Penrith. Penrith. Green, green, the grass is green. That's an old song. All right. What else? Anybody else? Anybody want to live in Sylvania? Got some Sylvania? Okay. How about Balmain? Yeah, okay. So we've got, there are these individual differences, and so different people say, I'd like to live in different places. And this was your modal choice. It doesn't surprise me that this would be the modal choice. Close to the city, exciting, young, that these kind of old folks in there, this kind of looks like me, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> be a little bit further away, you know. Um, so we expected to find, I expected to find these differences. And I, my first group of honor students, I sent them out into neighborhoods, life could be far worse, guys. This is before the internet, 1992. Sent them out in neighborhoods with questionnaires, asking people about their neighborhoods, um, what they thought of their neighborhoods, and about their personality, okay. And guess what I found? I found that the people who lived in this neighborhood, this neighborhood, this neighborhood, and this neighborhood were pretty much the same. That personality was not associated with the choice of suburb. Too bad. Okay. And this is even true after controlling for socioeconomic status. That some neighborhoods, Balmain, turns out to be very, very expensive. So sorry, tell us you couldn't tell from the street. Okay. After controlling for for money, for the cost of housing, still, it didn't work. But, it turns out that personality does matter. And if we consider the characteristic of openness to experience, we find that among people who are high in openness to experience, they're happiest when they're closest to the city. This minus one, which looks like a weird value for a distance, that's in standard deviations, and I apologize for the metric. Okay, so people up here, they live very, very close to the city. They're most satisfied, happiest, if they're far from the city. High in openness, happiest when you're far. Um, low in openness, happiest if you're close. Excuse me, uh, I've got that backwards just now, I apologize. Low in openness, you are happiest if you're far from the city, if you're in Penrith. People who are who are wary of others, who don't resonate that much to issues of culture and diversity and so forth, they, they're happiest when they're far. Okay? People who like city life and so forth, surprise, uh, cultural amenities are going to be happiest when they're close in. Okay. So this was kind of a cool study, and this is one of the first showing effects of personality characteristics in preference for um, you know, a residential environment. A little bit later today, we're going to be talking about personality characteristics and preference not for a residential environment, but for an academic environment. Okay. So that's one way in which um, uh, personality matters. Here's another. Here's another. We think, how many of you have taken a personality test like a Myers-Briggs type indicator? That thing that tells you, I'm a, oh look at this, more than half the class, okay, uh, that tells you I'm an ENTP, or a ISTJ or whatever, okay, or an ENFP. Did I get it? First one. Huh? First one. ENT. Right. So um, the Myers Briggs, this one measure of personality type, people like to think in terms of types, 
the same reason we'd like to embrace our kind of astrological signs. It defines us as part of a group. And, but it turns out the types can be defined by scores on dimensions. And two really important dimensions are these. The first is an orientation towards rules. When you see a sign that says something like, no bikes, or no dogs, or no skateboards, some of you think that that sign means no dogs, or no bikes, or no skateboards. Some of you think that that sign is an opportunity to engage with and question authority. Why? Why no dogs, bikes, or skateboards? Okay? So, some of us, and there's this really fundamental difference. Rules make society work, but if rules aren't questioned, we live in a very, very different world that I think we don't want to live in. We want a, we want a community in which there are all these types of people. And so one of the most important lessons in personality psychology is, it's a basic lesson in diversity. We talk about diversity, we think of diversity in terms of ethnic diversity, diversity of sexual orientation, diversity of this and that. But there's a very basic type of diversity, and that's diversity in personality. There's no single ideal personality. None of us would want to live in a community which consisted solely of any one of these types. Okay? The ideal community includes all these types. And the Honors College is such a community. I've got a hand back in, in the back. Yes? No? No. Okay. All right. So we've got, we could think of these multiple ideals. Somebody who's extroverted or oriented towards others, social, okay, who likes rules, that person could be a good leader. And somebody who likes rules but is more private. That could be a good worker, and somebody who's an inspiration to others. Somebody who's extroverted and outgoing, but questions rules, is somebody who can take the lead in doubting. And finally, the introvert who questions rules is the visionary artist. And this is where we have the title of today's talk. These are the politician, the professor, the poet, and the police officer. And there, if I may have some alliteration, um, I lost you, unless you're going to become a police officer, which is a fine endeavor. Um, so, uh, the idea is that we can describe different professions in terms of these things. You know, the first slide was on the ideals, the strengths, the potential, the professions. But we can also talk about...